Hi everyone and welcome to this special event which is part of the RIBA's Inclusion by Design Festival. My name is Alan Valance and I'm the Chief Executive of the RIBA. Today is part of a programme of events we're hosting every day this week in celebration of National Inclusion Week. If you've been unable to attend or missed an event, they're all going to be recorded and you'll be able to view them again on our website at architecture.com. As an organisation, the RIBA is working hard to ensure that architecture is equally open to all, regardless of background or circumstance. Currently, it is not. We know there are discriminatory barriers preventing talented people from studying, practising or even appreciating architecture. And we take our role in breaking down barriers and driving much needed change at pace very seriously. As part of this, we're using our platforms in um, such as Teams to create safe environments within which we can all share an understanding about the key issues. Our Inclusion by Design Festival is providing an opportunity to learn from global experts and thought leaders on a range of topics, from race and gender equality to social mobility, disability and LGBTQ plus inclusion. So thank you all very much indeed for joining today. Whether you're on the panel or not, I encourage you to please join the discussion and make a contribution by sharing your questions, thoughts and insights. We're all here today to learn from each other and we have roughly 300 people or so online, which is a great start to our festival. I'm going to hand over now to our event host for today, RIBA Executive Gender Champion, Adrian Dobson. Adrian. Thanks very much for that uh, welcoming introduction, Alan, and, and hello everybody. Um, as Alan says, my name is Adrian Dobson. I'm Director of Professional Services at the RIBA. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you today to our event with the title The Architecture of Gender at Work with Professor Elizabeth Keelan. And as you know, this is the first event in a week long RIBA Inclusion Festival. Um, and I'm told that we've got about 300 people attending today. So, so thank you to so many of you for, for dialing in. Um, the format today is I, I'm going to give a little brief introduction just to set the scene and then we're going to have a keynote presentation from Elizabeth Keelan and Elizabeth is a professor of leadership and organisation and um, she's going to talk to us for, for a little while and then she's going to be joined by a panel um, and each of the panel members is going to say just a little bit about their own experience of gender equality and um, what they've been doing about it in their own practice context etc. And then we're going to open it up and have a general, a general Q and A session. And um, the panel is going to consist of um, Joe Bacon, who's a member of our RIBA board, RIBA council member Simone de Gale, um, the former chair and in fact the founder of Architects for Change, which is our diversity experts advisory group, which is Samita Singer, and also RIBA council member Tim Clark. As, as Alan said, each of the executive team members of the RIBA has been asked to take a dimension of equality and diversity and be a champion for that subject area. And I've agreed to take on the role of executive gender champion. Um, and I thought I'd just say a little bit about, you know, my past experience around this subject area. I, I suppose in reality, I've really been involved in working with Architects for Change and the RIBA Board and Council, particularly around equality and diversity in the profession. So it's in the kind of professional arena that I've had the most involvement. And I thought I'd just say a little bit about some of the statistics. Um, there's no shortage of bright, creative young women coming into architecture. In 2005, we already had about a third of new entrants into the schools that were women. By 2015, that was virtually at 50%, and that's continued to be the case. So in terms of the entry end of the profession, there's plenty of good news. However, it's taking time for that to show through in the statistics in terms of the actual professional membership. Um, and it's probably not happening as fast as that demographic change to suggest it should. So for example, we now have about a third of architects on the ARB register that are female. The RIBA is clearly struggling in some ways to attract that female membership because about only a fifth of RIBA members are women. So there's a, there's a, there's a differential there. The other thing that's interesting to note is that whilst women now make up 45% of architects with under five years experience and indeed about 40% of the staff in chartered practices, 
They only make up 20% of the directors and partners in architectural practice. And of course, that then translates into quite a significant gender pay gap that still exists. So it's thought that there is still quite a large body of women that leave the profession during the architectural career. And I'm sure we'll come to some of that within, within this debate today. Um, I was just looking at the attendance statistics there. I should say a number of years ago, about four years ago, I was asked would I attend a, a, an event by the organisation Women in Architecture in the Jarvis Hall at the RIBA. And there were about 230 people at that event. And I, I noticed that I was the only one of two male faces in the audience. So there were two out of 200. So I did just do a little look at the, at the, at the figures last night. We only had 250 officially signed up last night. And about 50 are male, I think, today. So we're about 20% of the audience today. And, and I think that may be relevant to some of the, the subject area we'll, we'll, we'll cover today as well. Um, the other, the other little point I wanted to make is, obviously, I've talked a bit about the kind of professional aspect, but I think what we are becoming increasingly conscious of as an organisation is that all these elements of diversity are as much about the internal organisation as the external profession, you know, so within, so without. Um, and we are beginning to do more work around gender diversity and gender equity within the RIBA itself. The RIBA, just like the profession, has a significant gender pay gap. So there's clearly, clearly work to be done. Anyway, that's just a little bit of statistics to set the scene. I, I've been asked, will I do just a little bit of housekeeping and to explain the way the event is going to work. Um, we are recording this session today so that those that can't join us live will be able to access the video afterwards. Um, we hope the technology will work for us today. We are still on, on a bit of a learning curve with Teams and Zoom and all the rest of it, but we've got all, all nearly all our speakers in the green room, not just one missing at the moment. Um, but we'll keep you all up to date. As I say, the event's going to begin with our keynote presentation, followed by some little responses and then a Q&A session. So please do submit any questions using the Q&A function on Teams. And obviously we'll do our best to get through as many of those questions as we can. It's always a bit of a rush, but we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to, to get through as many of them as we can. But we will try to finish promptly at 1 p.m. So I'm simply now going to introduce our guest. We're delighted to welcome Professor Elizabeth Keelan to our event today. Elizabeth is Professor at Essex Business School, University of Essex, and her research focuses on women in leadership, men as change agents for gender equality, generations at work, and diversity and inclusion more generally. And she's published three books and numerous peer-reviewed articles in academic journals. So I'm now going to hand over to Elizabeth for the, the main part of our presentation today. Hello everyone, I'm very pleased um, to be with you virtually um, in this format today. So um, thank you very much also for Adrian to, for the introduction and generally for the invitation to speak a bit today about um, what role gender plays in architecture. And when you look at architecture, it's really not so different to other areas in the professional world, even though obviously like you know, in my own work context, we always see um, only our immediate work context rather than looking at the wider pattern. So what I aim to do um, is to look at, you know, some of the general patterns that, you know, reflect from how society is organized into the profession, but also look a bit at the specifics. So how um, does architecture differ from other areas? My a talk will be structured in two key parts. So I will first talk a bit about um, the building blocks of how the gender architecture works um, in this particular sphere, and then shift to some of the actions that we can take to make changes happen. So that will be a nice segue into talking a bit with the panel about you know, the changes that we can make. And um, in my remarks, I very much consider it a gender conversation. And gender is not only about women, it is about men and women. And so I'm very pleased to hear that some men are in the conversation today live with us, and I hope that many more will listen to it later on, because if we want to tackle gender inequality, it really has to be a men and women together. So let me start off by giving you a quick overview about where we are in terms of research. And we do have quite a lot of research on gender, space, the built environment, and how that matters, um, you know, when we're considering how we design spaces. And this, you know, is a body of work that many of you will be at least remotely familiar with. Um, then we can look at 
um, architecture as a workplace in itself. And we see that academically it is thinning out in terms of the evidence. There's not too much current research on the state of the field, how are working relationships today. Um, some of the literature has been published in the early 2000s, but you know, really for the last 20 years, there's not so much. So I will draw a bit on the research that's been coming out in the last few years to give us a bit of an indication where we are going, because as you have just heard, the field is changing, it's changing rapidly, and some issues go away and others persist. So I have prepared five building blocks I would like to talk about today that define the architecture of gender. And the first of those building blocks is really the overall gender system. So that's a system of gender that exists widely in societies and that is pretty static or at least perceived as static over time. So what am I talking about here? So I'm talking about the basic associations between you know, gender and what you can be in society. And that starts off very early on, right? So if you're just thinking about um, you know, how babies are already gendered, um, how colors are associated with those babies, right? So the pinks and the blues, which continue um, right through, um, you know, to, through our life, really. Um, if you're thinking about colors in specific, which I think will be quite interesting, you know, from a more visual perspective, is that, you know, while we today associate pink very strongly with girls and women and blue with men and boys, and that hasn't always been the case. There's actually quite a bit of change that we have observed where, you know, just a few hundred years ago, we actually associated pink with boys because it was thought to be a very viral um, color that men are, you know, kind of um, show the strengths of men really um, in, in you know, society. So these things do change. And this is actually giving us a lot of room for hope as well, because it shows that these associations are, are largely based on societal constructions. They're based on how we connect individuals and gender. So that obviously has a huge impact in the form of stereotypes um, onto, you know, kind of what we associate with men and women. And more importantly, what, you know, professions, girls and boys and what jobs in general girls and boys feel are appropriate for them. What is it that they pick in the first instance? So in the truth and the reality is still that if you picture an architect in your mind, the likelihood is that a man comes to mind, probably a white man, an able-bodied man as well. And these stereotypes are very persistent, but they can change over time. And the research we have has looked, for instance, at managers and how managers over time are still associated with masculinity, but in the last five or so years, we see more femininity creeping into um, how we associate managers. And I think that is something that we can work with. But also when you think about the key skills and attributes that are associated with the profession of architecture, we think about analytical thinking, mathematics, technical thinking. All of those things are very much associated with masculine, um, in the masculine sphere in society rather than the feminine one. Um, so that's something in particular in the Western world that um, is a key stereotype and um, that we see replicated in architecture. And that is partly why um, up until recently we saw fewer women join the profession. And um, we call that in research terms horizontal segregation. So horizontal segregation means that men and women are present in different jobs and professional fields. Standard example here doctors and nurses, right? So this is something traditionally we see very clearly. And the same with lawyers and primary school teachers, where we clearly have a gender association with it. So that's part of the problem of what we see today, the horizontal segregation that is embedded you know, in the gender system. The second building block is the leaky pipeline. So the leaky pipeline means that the women who join an area of work are more likely to drop out on the way to the top of the organization or the profession. That's what, you know, the leaky pipeline really stands for. And the leaky pipeline is an expression not of horizontal segregation, but what we call vertical segregation in research terms. That means women are clustered in bottom level, entry level positions and not in the senior positions in any field. So you will see, for instance, you know what um, we have just heard that 50% of the entrants in architectural schools today are women. However, 
only 20% of women are actually in senior practice. That is a standard example of the leaky pipeline and the vertical segregation we see in this area of work. So somehow it's not just a matter of time, but it's also a matter that women do drop out um, on the way um, to more senior positions. And that is not so different. If you look across um, a range of jobs and professional areas, where we see exactly the same, where the leaky pipeline is very dominant. Even in areas where we have lots of women who enter um, an area of work, they tend to drop out when it comes to senior leadership positions. So that is something that we have seen over decades in research. And obviously, if you think about horizontal and vertical segregation together, you understand why we still have a gender pay gap. So between 10 and 15 percent, depending on if you look at the median or the mean of that. So when we are looking at um, you know, things like the gender pay gap, horizontal and vertical segregation certainly play a huge role when it comes to replicating this gender pay gap. However, there are other reasons that we uh, need to look at when we want to understand um, why we see the first two building blocks. And that leads me to talk about the third building block, which is really the motherhood penalty. So the motherhood penalty is something um, that we have used in research to describe where women don't reach the top of organizations. So the motherhood penalty doesn't necessarily refer to um, women having children or being the primary carer for them, even though that is part of the story, but it refers to the fact that women are seen as potential mothers um, regardless of their actual status as mothers. So in research, we use motherhood penalty um, for the penalties that women um, suffer from because the workplaces are designed around men and the workplaces are designed around um, an ideal worker, which is more likely to be a man than a woman. So everything around that, you know, is designed to suit more of a standard traditional male pattern than a female pattern. And obviously we see that very starkly in regards to who cares for children and who is responsible for elder care. Obviously women tend to be uh, much more responsible there and we have seen that through the COVID-19 crisis really um, particularly um, in a very strong way. Um, but it is you know, also something that we have seen way before. The long hours work culture is something that is difficult for anybody who has any outside of work responsibilities. Um, the thing I just want us to remember is that the motherhood penalty is not only relevant for women who are mothers, but also those um, who are not. Let's talk about the force building block, and that is a bit of a newer area, a new area that is emerging in research on gender and architecture more recently. And this um, area is particularly relevant for the future, which is a concern about artificial intelligence, the future of work, how big data is transforming the workplace, um, all the things around algorithm that we constantly hear, automation of repetitive tasks, but also things around you know, how we design smart cities and smart homes and smart workplaces and all those types of things. So we clearly know that artificial intelligence is gaining importance, you know, also in the profession of architecture. So things like, um, you know, building information modeling is something that is becoming increasingly important. However, we also see that this is an area where new forms of gender inequality are fast emerging. So if you look at education, um, the research evidence suggests that women are not specializing in things like um, design technology to the same degree as men do. So already a difference is emerging in education um, that is potentially setting up women um, to be less present in those areas that are going to gain importance in the future. Additionally, um, we also see that um, for the women who are already in the profession, women often lack time to invest in those future oriented skills around artificial intelligence and are thereby not creating themselves, you know, um, as an opportunity seeker in this new space. So the new research that has come out um, in peer reviewed journals, um, which was actually an Australian piece um, that has come out, showed very clearly that for women working in architecture, they do not have the time to invest in developing those future proving skills. The final building block is intersectionality, and that is really referring and bringing to the front of our mind 
to this idea that we are all unique human beings. We are as unique as our fingerprints. So just looking at one dimension like gender is inherently problematic. It's a crude category because we are much more complex and multifaceted individuals. So we need to look at other areas as well. So obviously throughout this week, you will have many more presentations and panels on all other dimensions, but it, this is just a reminder that we need to um, be very much aware of the fact that our identities are built in much more complex and multifaceted ways, and that we need to consider how we as human beings have different categories that matter for us. So when we discuss um, gender today, gender might be the category that might be in the foreground, but actually, if you look at um, you know things like you know race and ethnicity um, over the week, those identity um, categories might be more in the foreground. So just keeping that in mind as we go through this presentation today and the panel, but also throughout the week. So let me just now turn to think about um, how we can change the picture, how we can create um, a profession that is actually future-proof for women and men to contribute to it equally. So I want to talk about three areas here, attract, retain and develop. So attracting women, um, obviously we need to think about the stereotypes that I've just talked about and how those stereotypes creep into um, how we even recruit people. Um, and there's now a whole lot of um, technology available that we can use to avoid that. So for instance, there's a technology called Textio that allows us um, to look at if you know, our job adverts are mobilizing gendered stereotypes, either more male or more female, and how we can find more balanced words to describe that. So instead of talking about you know, somebody assertive, it's an other word that we can use for that. And you know, that is kind of something we can start to um, look at when we look at recruiting, but it's also something that we can consider when it comes, for instance, to salary negotiations. Um, we have now a lot of evidence of the fact that women are often less aware of what can and can't be negotiated. So something that you might want to do is to say, well, actually thinking about um, you know, things that we can negotiate, these things, you know, unfortunately we have no wiggle room, but here are some things that we could talk about. Just making it very clear that there can be a negotiation. It doesn't only have to be salary, it can also be other um, perks and benefits that might be quite attractive to men and women respectively. Um, so this is just about the attracting bit. Um, the element around retaining women, we have to think very carefully, how can we ensure that women are not leaving the profession uh, or architecture more generally? What we know from other professions is that women very often take a bit longer um, to reach senior professional levels than men do, and they have a longer period in which not much is happening. And the research evidence and we have is that mentoring can play a key role um, to help women through that period, right? To have a mentor in the organization who can tell you a bit more what you have to do to get promoted, but also to sustain yourself over this longer period of time, because it might just take women still a bit longer than men because of the additional commitments they have to reach those positions. So having a mentor um, should program in place is central. And we know that very often there can be a bit of a reverse mentoring effect as well. So if you have you know, a male mentor who is mentoring a more junior woman, the junior woman might actually tell um, the male mentor something um, that is you know, very important um, for him to enhance his own learning as well, right? So something that will ensure that um, you know, he um, can change his practices as well. Um, Retaining also includes things like, you know, being sure that women are um, on the key projects and that they are participating in those, you know, career enhancing projects that are part of the key decision making processes. It's finally developing women. So yes, of course, you can do leadership programs for women. And those leadership programs are very important. They've changed quite a bit over the years. So it's now much more about developing your authentic voice as a woman. Um, so thinking about that is absolutely key. However, we also increasingly see programs that help men to be more inclusive leaders. So having training programs specifically for men to help them to lead in more inclusive ways is also very important because then you change your environment as well and not just women. 
Finally, think about sponsorship. So I talked about mentorship already. Mentorship is you know, something that is normally assigned and you provide a bit of advice. It's pretty you know, low commitment. Sponsorship is very different. Sponsorship is often not assigned, but it is about having a sponsor who really is in your corner, who you know, ensures that you get a good project, um, who ensures that he fights your corner when you're not in the room. Um, so that is something, you know, that uh, you should also consider when it comes to developing women. So what are the sponsoring relationships that women have in an organization or in the profession more widely? And how can you ensure women profit from that? And our research evidence shows quite clearly that while women are over mentored, they're very often under sponsored. So they don't have, you know, the people who um, give them, you know, the additional support in terms of the capital that they need to advance and not just giving them advice. So advice is important, but actually doing a bit more is central. To, to just sum up, um, I want to stress that, you know, we still have a great need to develop better knowledge about how architecture and gender work together um, and what we can do to change our work environments to make them more women friendly. Um, and what we have seen so far is that actually if you make them more women friendly, you also will find that they're more suitable for many men who don't fit the standard mode of what it means to be you know, a man in society. And we see more and more of that as being relevant today. So that is just as a starter for us um, in this conversation to think about gender and architecture. And I'm really looking forward um, to the panel now. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. I've only been doing this for the last six months, but I finally might turn it on me myself. <laughs> um, thanks ever so much, Elizabeth. That was a very clear and structured argument that you put across there. And, and I think we've, we've all benefited a lot from the clarity of it, I'm sure. So um, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to stimulate um, an interesting discussion now over the next half an hour or so. That's a, that's a prompt for everybody to say, please do put your Q&As in the Q&A question stream. Um, we're keen to, hear, keen to hear a range of voices and, and stimulate a bit of debate about the issues we're trying to uncover today. What I'm going to do though is I'm just now going to give our panel members a little bit of a chance just to introduce themselves but in doing so that we've set them a little challenge. We've, we've asked can each of our panelists spend just a couple of minutes um, discussing why gender equality is important to them and what they do in their own practices to support gender equality and what they feel that the key issues are. So I'm going to turn first of all to Joe Bacon. Joe is Managing Partner at Eliza Morrison and is also a member of the RIBA board. Over to you, Joe. Same problem. OK, so I'm live. Um, thank you very much. Adrian, I'm absolutely shocked to hear that only 20% uh, of RIBA members are women. So um, one of the first things all of us has to do is uh, lead by example. So become a member. Um, uh, we need more women and we'd like you to be part of it. Um, I would say what I'm really interested in everywhere is balance. Um, in my election uh, leaflet to the RIBA Council, I committed to promoting a more diverse profession, help nurture new talent regardless regardless of characteristic or background so no one should feel excluded from an architectural career architecture has proportionally few women compared to law or medicine and the profession needs to be more accessible for lower income candidates ethnic minorities and architects who've qualified internationally this will only make our talent base stronger it will also make architecture we create better but it's not only an issue of fairness and equality, but an issue of good business sense. Research shows that organisations which have different perspectives are more creative and innovative. So um, that is why it'll make our talent base stronger. Highly inclusive organisations are apparently 120% more capable of meeting financial goals and generate 1.4 times more revenue. So gender diversity has been found, found to be competitive and companies in the top quartile for gender or racial ethnic diversity have better financial returns amongst national industry um, figures. So closing the overall gender pay gap in work has the potential to create across the British nation an extra 150 billion on top of the GDP forecasts 
2025. It's in, in all our interests. These are relevant and important to all of us in the workplace. So I was really pleased to be involved in the RIBA gender pay gap report, Close the Gap, in 2018. And I still believe this document provides relevant and valuable guidance to all practices. Um, I'm very proud that my practice has some of the highest percentage of female architects in the AJ100 since 2017, when the figures were first published. I'm super proud of this, but it's no time for complacency. We certainly still have huge challenges for wider diversity. And part of this conversation is um, to engage more people in that. So it can, it's relevant to every practice, whether small or large, and we can only do, th do that by leadership, which is why I'm here. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I'm now going to turn to Simone de Gale. Simone is the driving force behind Simone de Gale Architects, and Simone's just been re-elected for a further three years to RIBA Council. So I'm going to hand over to Simone now. Your two minutes not start now, Simone. Hi, thank you, Adrian, for your introduction. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this talk. It is really important for us to appreciate the importance of gender equality within our companies, within architecture, and generally uh, within business throughout the UK and internationally. It's a really important topic and of course, I have um, passion for it. Um, I'm a woman and um, I always wanted to be independent and that's why I set up my own company in the first place so that I could always be in control of my destiny as opposed to um, being uh, uh, you know, having to compromise and negotiate with um, the, the powers that be. But I think that the uh, Joe has touched on quite a, a, a few of the topics which I wanted to raise, which was the fact that having diverse boards and having diverse leadership um, in terms of gender, in terms of um, race, it actually um, makes the, the company perform better. And the research has shown that uh, this, is a, this is a fact. Um, I, I looked at some research myself um, by Glasgow Caledonian University and De Montford, and it showed over 12 year period that companies which were diverse performed better than those that were not. Um, but I wanted to also raise another aspect um, as to maybe why um, we have these issues. And it is um, down to what um, Professor Kalen said earlier about, um, you know, the, the, the workplace traditionally being the, the, the male's place to be and you know that the lady um, the woman will be at home looking after the children and of course you know women will continue to have children and and that's absolutely fine and but what we have been able to do is start to bring in better legislation to um, deal with families as they um, are established and as they grow. So I'm really encouraged by um, the paternity leave legislation in 2002, which um, it it's, is a two week maximum, um, which a, a man can take from his workplace. Um, but then I'm, I'm really um, enthusiastic about the shared parental leave legislation, which came in in 2014. And that gives up to 50 weeks for the parents to share um, um, that time away from work, which means they can start to build their family together and they can look after their family. And what it means is that it gives much more flexibility within the family um, for the male and also the female to start to raise their children. And, and what that means in turn is that the workplace is going to start to look at both the male and the female as equals because one could take the leave or the other could take the leave. Um, it's not all going to be on one particular um, aspect of that family. So I'm really encouraged by this legislation and we just need to, um, you know, um, implement this more into the, the work that we do into our company so that we can, um, you know, continue to drive forward a more equal um, opportunities, better businesses and, and businesses that thrive. 
Thanks very Thank much Len, for that very comprehensive uh, summary there. And now I'm just going to turn to my next um, guest on the panel, which is Samita Singer. And Samita has been involved in this field for a very, very long time, because as I said at the beginning, Samita actually established Architects for Change as the RIBA's Equality Forum, and is a past chair of Women in Architecture. So Samita, over to you for your thoughts, please. I think you're on mute, Samita. An easy mistake to make, because I know to my cost. <laughs> Unmuted, sorry, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a sense of deja vu when I'm listening to all these particular points as well, because having been associated with the RIBA for 25 years, a lot of these things have been brought up before. So when I became Chair of Women in Archi Architecture in 1999, there were 8% female architects, Year after that, I set up Architects for Change, which was the RIBA's Equality Forum, which commissioned the research, Why Women Leave Architecture. And uh, sad to say, most of the conclusions of that research report still actually applies. Today, we have 28% women architects. So at this rate, we'll get to 50% gender balance in 22 years time. So unless women get involved in making the decisions about our built environment, we'll continue to get environments that are unsuitable for more than 50% of our population, which isn't very good. Um, the profession of architecture remains very white and very male. And this is very surprising, um, as Elizabeth talked about, because for a very long time, we've had 40 to 50% female students. So somewhere between studying and finishing, these women disappear. And that is why the introduction to my four volume publication, Women in Architecture, was titled The Vanished. The gender balance of women in architecture is similar to the gender balance of other construction professions, roughly similar. So there is something that's going on within the whole of the construction industry that we perhaps could explore with other cognate professions. So drawing upon my work in the RIBA, and I also work in the NHS as a non-exec and sit on the workforce committee, and from my teaching, here are things that don't work. So unconscious bias training, the positive effects barely last a day, according to nearly a thousand studies. Users um, get different scores, wildly different scores, whenever they retake the test. Second, staying silent and relying on merit and experience. Um, this hasn't worked because meritocracy doesn't work sometimes, mostly, usually. And diversity training, there are a whole lot of programs going on and people use them as like tick box exercises. Um, what works? Uh, these, this is a result of research being done by other HR companies, uh, including they've included research from construction companies as well. So the first, Elizabeth also talked about this, executive sponsorship. So helping women reach the top, especially ethnic minority women who don't do as well as white women. And this was the most successful, successful initiative for ethnic minority women. And second, visibility. You can't be what you can't see. So seeing other women succeed and get to the top is very important. And thirdly, for those women and the men up there, to mentor and train. And this particularly helps younger women and really ought to start during education before the women vanish altogether. Thank you. Thanks very much, Samita, and, and thanks for reminding us, you know, just how long this issue has been well known in the profession and the, the 2003 survey, which I think we may we may come back to. Um, I'm really pleased to say that um, our final um, panellist is, is Tim Clark. Tim's been having a few technical issues, but Tim is the councillor for Europe on the RIBA Council. And I think you're joining us from Germany today, Tim. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, I am actually. And um, it's, um, it's pretty gloomy over here, but... Uh, this is cheering me up, this discussion. It's um, a very good discussion. Let me just be brief with my two minutes. Is that all right? OK, um, I made a note to myself in case it wasn't raised before to emphasize the problem of population growth and its huge negative impact on EDI and on the environment. As individuals tend to regress into family isolation and reproduction. I think this is something we've mentioned before, but it's very important to pause on the fact that 
women are actually dumped in the situation where they are mostly expected to raise the children. And it's a very big challenge for us to rebalance that situation. Our challenge as architects is therefore to build also livable communities with sufficient calm to inspire the tolerance, inclusion and capacity to learn that we need in order for communities to become more aware of their uh, the damage they can do to themselves by simply expanding and, 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 and having children and new families without any kind of infrastructure. Um, in um, Germany, and I work at Deutsche Bahn, um, we have uh, a principle of, of, of support for um, women who um, have children and it's much more balanced, uh, there's much more role sharing and um, it, it spans many months after the child is born and, and there's much more infrastructure to fall back on. And I think this is very important and it doesn't happen in the UK. And I noticed that I'm uh, the only man in a panel of five, I think. Um, and I was raised as an adopted only child in a largely white Southwest part of Surrey with a mixed gender state school background. So I, I'm just telling you this because it kind of gives a bit of coloring to my, my position. And at architecture school, we had 20% of women in my year, but I was actually totally blind to the kind of issues that they face. Um, when I got to university as a professor in, in York, um, I ran a series of um, events to spotlight women's struggle to win the right to vote, for recognition in business and science and literature, and the culture that, they, that women have developed of effective resistance and, and, and advocacy. Um, societies in all these instances seem to be behaving very badly. Uh, can, can you believe that France only gave the vote to women in 1944? Um, diversity is essential if we are to progress. Um, and to be change behaviour, <clears throat> we need to generously encourage good behaviour and not to um, meet up punishments for bad behaviour. I mean, people do behave badly, there's no doubt about it. Um, this is consistent with the edicts of um, Peter Drucker, who, who uh, Antoinette mentioned in her, opening, in her notes that she sent around earlier on, and with my own research on economic incentives to reduce the environmental impact of developments, um, we just need to encourage people and not to wrap their knuckles for things that go wrong, because people do make mistakes, and we want to encourage the things that work. Um, so we have, um, I think uh, a duty to build in what we think is the right thing to do into our daily routines and training in the office. And we all have a role to play in EDI in terms of gender. This means enabling women to advance and excel unhindered in an, ex in an inclusive setting without feeling threatened passively or actively, verbally or physically. We can help each other, men helping women and vice versa to do better. We need to work together. This is a very, you just introduced this, I think, uh, Sumita. Only then can we begin to exceed the stale benchmarks of the past and we will all be winners when we enable the talents of others to flourish. That's my message. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. And um, so glad that we managed to connect you in the end. Sorry about the technical difficulties we've been having. Yeah, I, I, um, felt, we, I felt excluded actually for a moment. We've got, we, the, good, the good news is we, we've got lots of questions, folks. I guess that that means that it's now going to be quite a challenge. So I'm going to try and rattle through as many as we can. Um, but it's great that we've got lots of questions. So the first one up is from Karen. Karen says, when mentoring is failing, the leadership doesn't find the time and sponsorship is missing, what more can the women do for themselves to develop? And maybe I'll, I'll let Elizabeth have perhaps the first the first go at that one. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's you know very common question, right? Mentoring doesn't work, sponsoring doesn't work. It feels like you're really stuck. And there was another question around, you know, what can we do for ambitious young women? So how can they best advance their career? So I think it's important to realize as part of the culture, you know, where you are part, you know, um, in this bigger picture, you know, that has a gender system that operates in a specific way. And there's part that you can influence yourself. Right. So if you feel that you know, there is not much support in terms of mentoring, doesn't work, the sponsorship is clearly not available, maybe you need to look more widely. 
Maybe there's a person who is not directly working with you in another firm, maybe in another organization, maybe even in another setting that is quite useful um, for you, know, you to get more advice. You can also think about other things like, you know, is there a leadership program that you could attend? Um, is there specific literature that you can get stuck in? Any leadership books that might be um, relevant? There are always ways in which you can develop yourself, even if your environment is not only not supportive, but in many cases even hostile, right? So you need to have something that nourishes you through this time and you really need to figure out what that can be for you. But I'm sure that many of the women on the panel will have, you know, much more insight from working in the fields than, than I do. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Does it, would anybody else like to come in on this issue of um, when mentoring and sponsorship isn't present? Jo, sorry. Um, first of all, say so. Um, say to your leaders um, it's not working. Um, no point in not um, being clear about that to, to your leadership within your practice. And secondly, think about women supporting women. So talk to other women in your practice, whether um, or from your college. So I think we need to um, support each other and, um, and have confidence um, through that process of improving things. Thanks very much, Jo. And I think the next question coming up, so, sorry, Sita, did you want to have a final say on that one? Yeah, so it's really agree, agree that you raise, raise the point yourself first and try and resolve it within the practice. And I would go and do a second step. You know, if, if it's not being resolved in, say, six months time, then think about leaving and going somewhere else. It's no point wasting your talent and energy in a place that won't nurture you. Um, and the, what I did was when I joined a board, I had no previous experience and also of chairing, I didn't have experience before. So I spoke to a lot of women outside architecture and it's sad that I had to go outside architecture and be mentored by women who were much willing to actually tell me how it's done. So I think go outside um, and, and look for help because you just want to get all the help you need, right? And so it's, it's no point waiting for someone to come and rescue you. Thanks, Avita. Um, this next one feels like it could be a, a real quick fire, quick round the table. It, it's simply, if you could give one piece of advice to a young, ambitious woman, what would it be? I, I guess in the context of architecture for our architecture panel members, but... Uh... Um, well, I would say that, um, you know, just it's just following on from the previous question that there, if you're not getting mentoring and it's not satisfactory at your company, um, there's lots of groups and um, lots of initiatives out there. And there are a lot of um, focus groups which um, provide a platform for women. So I would look into those groups um, to get support. And I would say that, you know, um, surround yourself with like-minded people and um, you'll be successful. Thanks, Simone. And it, Tim. You, yeah, I just wanted you know, to some advice. Can you, can you hear me okay? Um, yes. I, I wasn't sure whether I was muted before actually, but um, the, the pr principle of forming alliances is quite important. I think, you know, we shouldn't form factions where we come in and, and come in as a block and say, well, we want to have <laughs> we want to have more of this or more of that. I think there's a, a very Im important um, principle of, of trying to work w across across the divide, if you like. And, and I think that in my experience is that lots of women who actually help men to understand what the women's issues are and, and, and to really talk about that in a, on a one-to-one -one basis and, and vice versa. And I think that there's a bridge there which we can take advantage of. That's it. Thanks, Tim. I, I just wanted to just following up on that, Elizabeth, is, I was making the sort of point at the earlier part of the meeting that I once went to a, a Women in Architecture event where there were virtually no men present at all. And it's just around this, the, you know, you've said, We've had this point of women supporting women, but the role of men in the workplace. And would you have any comments to add on that? Um, 
Thank you. That's a really important question that we have been grappling with a lot. And if you look structurally at um, you know, finding a sponsor or supporter or a mentor who um, is another woman and you look for senior women, you quickly find that they're few and far between. And those women who are there already have a lot of commitments. They're constantly asked. And Many are very generous with their time, but I'm also aware that we put an additional burden on them. So I think it is time that we also ask men to join the conversation and to say, well, this is not just a conversation about women. It is something that affects all of us. And we have just heard about the business case. So innovation works better. Creativity works better. So and that's normally used to entice the standard white men to join the debates. Um, but what I want to stress is that very often men have huge gains from joining the discussion as well. They might join for reasons like they have a daughter or they notice, you know, that their wife was also an architect struggling more or something along those lines. Um, but they might find that actually there are many more things that they're really passionate about. And that is something we need to cultivate and foster because we have for too long trying to solve a societal issue um, as an issue that's only for women. And we really need to start widening the conversation and bringing more people in. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I, I, I'm going to try and combine two together, I think. So, so I've got one here that's a, almost a comment, but it says it's important to emphasise the reasons that the motherhood penalty is relevant to those women who are not mothers. Promotion, job opportunities and retention in positions, particularly in times of crisis, are less likely to, to be afforded to women. And we've also had somebody commented a little bit further down about the fact that in the last recession, there was quite a bit of evidence to show that women were disproportionately affected in terms of redundancy within the architectural profession, etc. So I wondered if we could talk about that issue more broadly um, and perhaps even in the context of the current crisis, because I think we hear different views about whether the move to home working is going to be beneficial to some groups or not. So uh, uh, any thoughts on that issue about um, the impact of economic crisis and how that relates to the, the motherhood penalty, etc.? Yes, I would just, I would just like to say that um, looking at the, um, like what I spoke about earlier about the legislation, the shared parental legislation and the paternity leave legislation, these are all uh, mechanisms which are going to help us, um, you know, bring about change within the workplace because it's a mentality that we are, um, are facing. It's a change in mentality in where previously the man would always go out and, you know, be, um, for lack of a better phrase, the, the breadwinner where the lady or a woman would stay at home and um, we need to change this mentality and I do appreciate that you're saying the motherhood penalty um, but you know I, I think it's um, it should also be um, appreciated that um, you know, women are, ch are child bearers and um, you, you might not have a child, but you might want to one day. So um, it's, a, it's a mentality um, that we have that we need to change. And these mechanisms, they will help us to start to um, balance the workplace. So instead of the mother taking all of the time off of work, the man will take time off of work as well. And once we are able um, to have more confidence in that process and in, in that shared um, parental aspect, then it will become easier for us to um, retain positions um, as women. Thank you, Simone. Anybody else had any thoughts on this kind of general issue? Tim? Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention again the environmental pressure that we're under of um, population growth. Um, the more people there are, the more uh, competition there is for fewer resources and, and jobs and opportunities and for that money that might be available in grants and, and subsistence. I, I do think we we need to take that seriously. It's it's a it's a combined front, if you like, on 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 our environmental um, sustainability and equity that we, in which we live, and also the the balance that we can achieve in our communities. And all the time we're under pressure from this this overgrowth in some particular areas in ghettos and in in developing countries that that we we see a lot, but also in our own country, we just we just need to. To take that seriously and 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 reduce our our impact, we, we we're a nuisance to the world. We're a nuisance to ourselves because there's too many of us. There's too many of us 
trying to do um, too much for ourselves, and we're not we're not thinking about the future in terms of population planning. We need to really think about that. Thanks, Tim. I think Joe's got a point out as well, and then Samita. So I'm going to go to Joe and then Samita. I, I am concerned um, about our current financial um, condition as a result of COVID. Um, I think one of the things that practice can do is um, be flexible. So we um, have found people challenged by lack of childcare during lockdown. And um, so a lot of people have um, gone to different working patterns, but also reduced their hours. We always allow people to work three days a week um, if um, they wish to. So more flexibility is required from practices to allow people different working patterns and reduce working so that they can share the load um, with their family on the caring responsibilities. But I am concerned that um, it is going to affect women in the workplace, this um, financial crisis. And so we need to be conscious of that and make certain we don't lose that talent um, from architecture. Thanks, Joe. I think Samita had a comment to add as well. Um, yes, yeah, so there is some evidence that women are being disproportionately affected by the COVID issues, and particularly those with uh, those from minority ethnic backgrounds. So they're already in the lower paid jobs and they are being affected. I don't know if there's been a survey done within the RIBA to find out what is happening, but it would be useful to know. I also know that because I'm a trustee of the Architects Benevolent Society, that more architects are coming in uh, with financial issues rather than mental health. So previously it was mental health that was the top of the agenda and now it's fin financial health they need. So uh, people are actually sort of prioritizing their issues. So it seems that they're kind of forgetting they're stressed out as well, maybe. So what what I would I would like to see some kind of evidence base um, on, on that being done by the RIBA. I would like to know how it's affecting um, gender, uh, women, uh, for example. And there is an interesting question here, which is um, highly qualified women in a broad range of careers, including architecture, are discouraged from returning to work after giving birth because uh, salaries just cover the cost of childcare. So low salaries is uh, an issue because women are at the lower end of the pay gap. So the, there is the gender pay gap already. And you know, if you're a young woman uh, having a child starting at your career, then you're going to be at the lower end of the scale where salary is concerned. So again, this is something the RIBA ought to look at and see how we can help uh, people. I know within the NHS, we had a very successful work from home scheme where people who were shielding or disabled and women who had caring responsibilities were able to work from home and that actually reduced their travel costs, for example, and other childcare costs. And so it was a bit of a balance between what they were losing and what they were gaining. So that sort of understanding of how we can help women uh, particularly minority ethnic women, would be great. Thanks, Samita. And I'm, I'm going to try and squeeze two last questions in. Um, so I'll try and squeeze two more in. The, the first one is, um, I've got a question that says, what can be done to better ensure trans men and trans women are brought along on the journey, journey of gender equality? Um, so I, I don't know, Elizabeth, would, would you be prepared to just give us an answer on that one, maybe? Yeah, um, that's you know, a really important question. And in gender terms, we generally perceive it as a binary. But what we have seen, you know, most recently, it has been uh, all over the news. Judith Butler, you know, has given uh, a nice interview, who was one of the main um, gender theorists. Um, I think it was in the New Statesman. So if you haven't seen it, it's worthwhile um, to check um, up on that. Um, looking at, you know, how and um, when we talk about men and women, that also includes trans women and trans men. So that is kind of something we need to be very mindful of because it's quite a, um, the process of thinking about gender is very often in this very static binary. And what we are actively trying to do is to see this binary as much more fluid. And academically, that's definitely something we have been doing for the last 30 years. And it's really pleasing to see that this is reaching wider fields. So um, definitely something you know to consider and to talk about more. 
Thanks very much, Elizabeth. I'm, I'm going to try and do one last question and I'm going to again try and, try and mix two together so that we try and answer both. So I've got an anonymous comment. The, the, the comment is the language we use is important and architecture as a profession and the RIBA have created many unnecessary gendered terms. A term I find particularly problematic is collectively the 50 or so large world leading practices we have in the UK are often referred to as the big boys. And Emily Crompton from Manchester School of Architecture says the stats show that the ball really is in practice is caught now. Practice needs to change and improve to maintain women in the profession. Um, and I suppose the question I'm going to try and put from that is um, not to suggest that necessarily everything is exactly as it should be within the schools of architecture, but there is evidence that, that women are graduating. But we've talked about this retention issue, the progression issues, etc. You know, so really probably a question I mean, for our practitioners, you know, where, where is where is practice currently failing to follow through? And, and have you got any any suggestions at all? Anybody like to pick the, the, the practice challenge up there? Thanks, Joe. you've come to my rescue. <laughs> well, um, uh, if somebody described the, the top practices of the big boys, I'd probably scold them. So I'm, I'm rather in the world of um, not letting the language um, be used in practice. So um, uh, what are you talking about? Um, I'm, I think, uh, encouraging people to have the conversations, talk about um, gender balance within in practice um, in relation to the last question we now have an LGDP um, allies group and um, they're some of the best they used to be pre-covid some of the best um, evening drinks you could go and join so get people to join behind you and with you in any movements uh, I I'm worried about the idea that the language is is male um, because actually an awful lot of effort goes into all documents to make certain that it's about an accessible profession. And I think it's really important that we, I mean, there were only in the year 1980 when I joined architecture school, only 12% of women were joining architecture schools. So we're in a much better place. What we now need to do as professionals and as um, RIBA um leaders is to encourage people to stay in the profession um, and engage with them all the way through that journey. Thanks very much Joe um, and thanks for taking up the, the practice challenge there. I, I think unfortunately we've, we've, we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, first I'd just like to thank everybody for putting their Q&As in and um, there's been a whole series that we haven't got around to I'm afraid. Um, Karen's got a further comment here she says research shows that women are 21% more likely to progress their careers after having children, if the male partner plays an active role in childcare. And that prompted a really interesting discussion I noticed in the feed on um, parental leave, et cetera. You know, so, so there's a whole area there that we've clearly not, not touched upon at all. But thank you to everybody who did put their questions in. Um, it seems that there's quite an appetite to, to have more debate, I think. Can I thank my architect panel members for giving so generously of your time and, and agreeing to be put on the spot with no knowledge at all as to what was going to be asked today. And my final thanks um, go um, to Professor Elizabeth Keelan for giving us such a clear and, and, and concise um, explanation today of some of the key issues. It was it was very, very, very clear in my view. Um, that really brings me just to a couple of closing remarks and, and a little a, a, an announcement. Um, I, I was tempted just before today to go back to the 2003 report that um, Samita brought our attention to again. Um, I'll just read a little bit of a, a report from time. It says, the survey revealed that the gradual erosion of confidence and de-skilling caused by the lack of creative opportunities for, me, for female architects, sidelining, limited investment in training, job insecurity and low pay, led to reduced self-esteem and poor job satisfaction in architectural practice. The research found that women's careers slowed after childbirth and that inflexible working arrangements, including long hours and lack of transparency in relation to pay and promotion, were the main reasons cited for women with children leaving the profession. The research concluded that women's decisions to leave the profession were not linked to academic or practical ability or to poor career choice. The report also stresses that many of these factors would apply equally to men that choose to leave the profession. So very much echoing a lot of the debate that we've had today, as, as Samita pointed out. And that's just to say that the, the, the final um, piece of news I wanted to give you today is that, that that report was done in 2003. 
And I think we can probably agree it is timely that perhaps some further work was carried out. And we've, we've agreed with Professor Keelan that we're going to work with her to, to develop a research programme on, on the gender aspects within architecture practice. And we, we hope to give you more information at that towards the, towards the end of the inclusion festival. So thank you to my, all my guests and, and, and thank you for those of you that have tuned in today. We, we hope you found it useful. Bye everybody.